Oh, I didn't actually ask permission. Okay. So we're now recording again. Um, and who would like to share first what happened in their breakout room? And I can actually share the, um, the results from the Google uh, form as well. So if that helps when you're recording that. Someone want to say from breakout room one? I'll, I'll share because we were talking about a project that um, I am doing in my class. So I'm a teacher educator. I teach literacy education courses. Um, and um, I've been kind of playing around with open educational practices outside of a renewable assignment that I did for one of my classes. So in this class, um, I want my students to walk away with a handful of tools that they can use to assess their students, their younger students, K-12 students, literacy skills. Um, and so as part of the class, I set up a document, a Google Sheet, um, and within the, the Google Sheet, they would all add in different literacy assessments that they read about, that they learned about, um, and classify them um, in lots of different ways, describe them, say who the assessments might be for. Um, and so, and then my idea is that each year when this iteration of the class comes around, the students will um, add to it. So we're creating this content knowledge piece um, that is constantly shared um, around everyone. So we said that it would be kind of content centric, but kind of process centric. Um, so yeah, we, we rated that in the middle um, of those. We said that it is teacher centric because I kind of designed and created the form and they're filling it in. Um, so everyone's contributing, but it was contributing within the realm of what I had on there. And I did give them choice, but then COVID happened and they just kind of started throwing information and in. the class got a bit derailed because all classes did last spring. Um, we, we said that it was definitely more pedagogically focused than social justice focused. Um, and of that, we were focused, or I was focusing on um, cognitive and knowledge dimensions and some skills and like thinking about this assessment and who it would be applied to. Um, so pushing it towards more social justice focus, um, we, were, we were thinking about how um, all literacy assessments can be biased against particular kinds of learners, right? Um, and, and so letting the students go in and, and they can either add assessments or they can think about the assessments that are on there and add in some of the biases or whose perspectives might be left out or um, uh, uh, the students that they're working with are students in the Bronx, New York, which is one of the poorest congressional districts in the United States. Um, so thinking about how some of the economic factors might not fully represent the students' skills and knowledge um, on these assessments and, and acknowledge that like on this sheet as it continues to grow and change. Um, so, so that's what we were thinking, like giving students a little more power and choice in that. I love that and, and giving them that critical lens because if we don't give it to them, they may, they may not develop it on their own. Thank you, Jonathan, that's great. All right, uh, we had a room too, right? Renewable assignments, would someone like to share that? Sure, I can. Um, I sort of hijacked the conversation uh, with an example of a renewable assignment that I'm currently running in uh, college level gen ed that I teach. So the course is titled Truth and Reconciliation and it focuses on Canadian settler uh, colonial harm as well as the residential school history specifically. And then toward the end of the semester, we switch our focus to Canada's 94 calls to action, uh, which are intended to uh, improve nation-to-nation -nation relations and, and really deal with those equity issues that abound in text. So in the renewable assignment, this is a capstone project in the course. Students are invited to select one of the 94 calls to action of interest to them and uh, research that call in a structured way. So I provide a framework in terms of their uh, their output, but they have a lot of agency of choice in terms of format, uh, selection of topic, and um, 
whether or not they're going to contribute ultimately to a public facing website called Nabawajige. Uh, in Algonquin, that means to examine closely, which is what we're doing in the assignment. And uh, they also have the option to apply or not various Creative Commons licenses. So that's the project in a nutshell. And the reason why I, I suggested we examine it is this is what I'm uh, researching for my doctoral dissertation through AU is uh, student perceptions of this particular experience of a renewable assignment. So we said that the, the OEP is more content centric because it's really focused on that output. Our intended audience are high school students in the Canadian context because my students have repeated that they wished they'd learned about this stuff sooner. Uh, so I said, okay, let's create something that high school students can benefit from. Uh, but there is process baked within the assignment. Uh, the group decided we were quite learner centric and that they have the agency. I, I tell them you're paddling this canoe now. Um, and actually I just sent that announcement out today. That's where we're at in the semester. So they paddle the canoe and I stand off on the shore supporting them as they go. Um, we said it was quite social justice focused. However, the nature of the assignment does allow for a lot of affect to come in and I encourage it. Students use their own personal voice. They're allowed to bring their emotion into the assignment and uh, get angry at the Canadian government or the lack of progress or the state of our, our relations in Canada. Um, so they're not silenced in that way. And, and that's important learning throughout the course. So uh, we skipped over the pedagogical focus because we did think it was more social justice. And the calls address all three of these spheres. So depending on what the students decide to go with, uh, they might be quite culturally focused, politically or economically. And then um, that final question was sort of when we got zooped, like uh, vacuum sucked back into the main space. But I think we were leaning more toward uh, that transformative, uh, I can't say that A word, so I'm not gonna try again, but we sit somewhere on uh, the left side of, of this, uh, this chart when it comes to transformation or at least acknowledgement of, of the current uh, state and requirements for change. Thank you, Jess. I mean, I was wondering actually where they get, how they do their research and if there are ways of, uh, if they are not themselves Indigenous, um, whether there's interaction with Indigenous people. Sorry, I'm making this longer, but just a quick question. Sure, yeah, it totally depends on the scope of their uh, project. Calls to action involve everyone, Indigenous, non-Indigenous, uh, new has a role to play. So they uh, select a specific example of an individual, a group, an organization working to support the call in a good way. So that may involve uh, engagement with Indigenous persons or communities, or it may not, um, because there are other agencies that are also working to support specific calls. So it all it is so dependent on the direction the student decides to go in, but there are often uh, really beautiful connections made. And a lot of students have told me that they uh, sustain that engagement after the course ends through volunteer uh, opportunities or the like. So it's uh, it's a really special project for me. Thanks for asking. Thanks, Jess. Okay, uh, Lena, this is the open syllabus. Thanks, Jess. I was just so, so nice to hear you talk about that project um, in more detail. I'm really looking forward to your research. <laughs> um, so Melissa and I uh, were not talking about something quite so specific or practical. We were talking kind of broadly about the syllabus. I had a little bit of a rant because I'm a current, um, I'm a current student, current online student, and um, and I just I find a 40-page PDF syllabus to be one of the most kind of um, unnecessary, in, in, unnecessarily intense and contractual beginnings of a course. Um, and so I am very interested in uh, the work of Michelle Pekansky Brock that she does around the liquid syllabus um, and and rethinking this whole idea of the syllabus. So, um, so we were talking about co-creating syllabuses. We were we were talking about a syllabus evolving throughout the course. We were talking about opportunities for students to have access to the syllabus, um, you know, maybe a couple of weeks in advance of the course beginning and being able to suggest 
um, new readings, um, different authors, um, you know, maybe even a change in the order of, of the reading. Um, and so, so for the, for the answers to the questions, we talked about it being kind of in the middle of, of contact, content and process, we were kind of waffling back and forth. Um, we, we thought it was more teacher centric, even though, um, you know, the students may have an opportunity to contribute. It's still a, it's still a tool for the teacher um, in the end, the syllabus. Um, so we kind of put, Put, put it a little bit leaning towards that direction. Um, and, and we, although there are opportunities um, to make it social justice focused, I was really reflecting on the definition of kind of what is so what true social justice focused work means um, that you shared at the beginning of your presentation and, and the, the, the explicit focus on um, on people who are marginalized or otherwise disadvantaged. And um, so I just couldn't see, I, I couldn't see, a, I, I'm sure there is a way that it could happen, but in the current kind of way we were conceiving of it, was thinking of it more as a pedagogical um, tool rather than a social justice tool. Um, but it could become a social justice tool if you if you asked the marginalized students in your course to design your syllabus for you <laughs> from scratch with no prior. But then I was thinking about how the concept of a syllabus even is kind of predetermined. So anyways, it's hard. Um, effective is definitely um, a, a key aspect of this um, for me. Um, and, and, you know, the political, being um, giving some of the power over to the students about what they're reading and when. We didn't even really finish this last question. <laughs> we had, I, it was because I took up a lot of the time ranting about syllabuses. It was my, completely my fault. Um, but yeah, I wanna thank uh, Melissa for, for having that conversation with me as well. Thank you, Lena. And I think you've also like come across all the different types of ways a syllabus could be open. You know, you're saying, oh, would it, how, how much time the students have? Would they just change it at the beginning? Could they change it? Could it evolve throughout? So there are all these different ways, even though you didn't answer the last question, you sort of touched on it a lot. Okay, I think the next room is room. So, I don't, sorry, questions. I don't want to take any more time, but I just want to say to Lena that I added a link to the um, Socially Just Academia page and Equity Unbound and, and there's a bit there also about oh, inclusive citation, you. which thank um, you. you might find interesting. I'm happy to chat afterwards as well. Okay, thanks. All right, eight, nine, and 13. Hopefully we have enough time. I wrote hopefully useful, but I actually said, I hope we have enough time. I can share from room eight. Yeah. Okay. So we were talking about collaborative annotation and interestingly, we were each able to bring kind of a different perspective on collaborative annotation. So um, one of us shared using um, an experience using hypothesis to sort of facilitate a community of practice around um, open educational practices and open pedagogy. So there was that idea about collaborative annotation almost being used as a, as a faculty or professional development tool um, to comment on readings and share. There was a perspective shared um, from an author who actually had one of their papers that's open on the web um, annotated un unknowingly until they came across those annotations. And then um, there was a perspective of being in a position to actually support instructors who are using hypothesis as, uh, or yeah, using hypothesis and collaborative annotation as a practice or as an assignment with their students. So it was with those different perspectives in mind that we actually answered these questions. Um, so to the first one, we said that collaborative annotation really lies in the middle of being content centric and process centric. Um, collaborative annotation can't really be removed from the comment uh, from the content that it's commenting on. But at the same time, it really is is and can be about that process of making your reading visible, making your thoughts about a, about um, a work visible as you're doing the reading. 
we said that it is more learner centric in that it's often used uh, for learner for more, so that more learners can share their thoughts about a reading and engage with each other. Although teachers can and do have the ability to really build assignments around it. So in that way, teachers could still be involved. Um, but often I think it's used or in our experiences, it's used with that idea of giving learners more of a voice. Um, we said it's certainly more of a pedagogical tool um, in that it's used to, to help um, address cognitive, um, the cognitive knowledge side of things. Uh, so not really used um, with a social justice focus in mind, but I think we said that it does have the potential to be used as a social justice kind of tool, um, particularly the political side of things, giving power to people whose voices are usually suppressed or who don't usually have the ability to share their thoughts about a reading. So empowering more learners to see their voices and their thoughts as valuable. Um, although unfortunately we didn't get to have much of a discussion around that last question <laughs> because we spent a lot of time sharing our experiences. Okay, I mean, that sounds like you did quite a lot in 20 minutes. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, regardless of the, the less field on the forum, I mean, if you were ended up talking about power and politics, it sounds like it was a really valuable discussion. So um, thank you so much. The I think process the process is more important than the document. Absolutely. <laughs> So I think the next group is group nine, if I'm not mistaken. Is that Marilyn? Yes, I am a group of one. Thank and you so much, Marilyn. <laughs> no problem. I had um, chosen the topic of virtually connecting, and the way in which I had um, interpreted that was to bring students together from different places, to use the power of web conferencing, to bring students um, to start talking amongst themselves, basically. And this was a result of an experience I had in a global citizenship class where we brought students from Eastern Europe together with our students here in Maine um, to have an exchange, <coughs> excuse me. And so in looking at whether it's content or process, <coughs> excuse me, I thought, you know, one could balance this, that it could go either way, and it depended on, um, you know, how much the students became involved, how, um, in how much the instructor put it in print. So I use that as a, a kind of neutral response to that. As far as teacher-centric or learner-centric, um, I think this has the potential to be more learner-centric, although if the instructor has a curriculum that they oftentimes can kind of have an input on whether, you know, have some kind of input that it wouldn't be totally learner centric. Uh, let's see, could we scroll down a little bit? Thank you. <coughs> um, for pedagogy, pedagogy, I'm looking at that as more of a pedagogical tool. Um, as far as bringing students together in terms of the, you know, original original conception and um, the cognitive and aspect, affective <coughs> dimensions, but also the, in terms of social justice, that culture would be brought into the exchange um, on, you know, what kind of target group here, um, neutral in terms of cultural, because it would depend on, you know, do you have minority students who are being represented in the conversation? And um, as far as how to improve this, be sure that students who are minority constituents are represented within the group so that they can represent that perspective. So do we want to go to group 13? Yes, thank you so much. Sorry, I wasn't sure um, if I was on mic there. Yeah, I mean, we only have a couple of minutes left, but I think we have enough for a two minute share from our last group and then Maha and I will just wrap up really quickly. So thanks. And thanks for that, Marilyn. Um, who's sharing from 13? Interesting, Michelle's still here. I nominate Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle. 
Michelle, do you accept? Um, I accept, I suppose. Uh -huh. yeah. um, we didn't, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, so we looked more about, um, I think, just the process of our spaces generally, rather than one kind of focus. Um, and so I think we really talked about this idea that Rajiv had put forward, uh, you know, about architectures um, that help promote OBP. And we, things like, you know, all of our spaces, both physical and virtual are governed by kind of someone else's decisions. Um, there's roles, for example, how do you create, um, how do you create a welcoming space in either? So we talked a lot about how that configuration really can um, allow people to feel like their voices can be heard. How can you create a participation, an architecture participation where multiple voices actually can be shared? Um, so we really, when we talked through the, the form didn't really fit us that well, it could be content focused, but it also could be process centric. So it really just depended. Um, it could be teacher centric um, or it could be learner centric OEP. So I think it just depends on what you want to do. Um, and then um, again, we thought it could be socially just. So depending on how we design our spaces, can you have, can you create a space where marginalized voices um, can really contribute in a meaningful way in that, in that virtual or physical space? Um, so we thought it could address all the different um, aspects and, um, you know, I think just generally we talked about the fact that we don't talk about space that much in relation to practice and it really dictates everything we can do and how we welcome um, the kinds of participation that we, we want. So hopefully that, hopefully just that, <laughs> that could, uh, captured everything we talked about. That's very powerful. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, it links to what Jess, you shared before, but that's um, much bigger. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I, I knew we, we would learn a great deal from you all sharing today. Um, will I just keep finishing, Maha? Are you, no you have noise in the background there? Are you okay? I still okay? have kind of noise. Yeah, I'll just post the link to the sheet. Okay. So folks can have. Oh yeah, you should. Can you share your screen, or do you want me to share? Would that help if I shared my screen? I can. Uh, I don't know if I can share. Sorry. Let me let me share for you. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm sorry that we we ran into this sudden wall of five o'clock. I know there are there are other things happening in people's lives. So we just wanted to say a sincere thank you. And I hope that um, with many of you that we can continue the conversations and share um, what we're doing. Um, this is just hearkening back to the paper that I shared right at the very beginning, um, a wake up call. And quite often we talk about hope um, in, in terms of open education, but this particularly complex conceptualization of hope is one that we that we really thought spoke to what what we're doing um, all together in this work around critical openness. And um, Laura Chernowicz and her co-authors talk about a fragile hope and an angry hope in um, systems where there are glaring inequalities and in systems themselves, which may be um, oppressive. So um, this final quote, we just wanted to leave with you about uh, that hope is critical because we keep calling out systemic injustices, but hope is also insistent because it is impossible to give up as long as possibilities exist for equity oriented change. So thank you all for bringing it today and uh, we look forward to connecting with you all in the future. Thank you. <laughs>